Praise God. We are to be the salt of the world and the light of the world. Amen. Glory to God. Refreshing is essential. Let's go to Matthew 25. Matthew 25. This is training for reigning. Amen. Matthew 25. We, if you need a Bible, we gladly have them. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. Matthew 25. Is everybody there? Let's speak it together. The kingdom of heaven shall be like in ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now, virgins are associated with believers. The reason why they're called virgins is because they've been washed by the blood of the lamb. Of course, there's another arena where a believer is actually a follower. So if you're not a follower, then you ain't a believer anyways. Amen? A lot of so-called Christians that are not followers at all. Verse 2. Now, five of them were wise and five were stupid or foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. In other words, they did not take the time to get refreshed and connected to the presence of God. They became religious. But those, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Verse 5. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Who's the bridegroom? Jesus. Amen. We are the bride. Jesus is the bridegroom. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps have gone out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourself. No one can give you oil. Amen? You must go purchase it yourself. That is the price that you and I must pay. We must purchase the oil. And how do you purchase it? Through getting, through fellowship. That's why the word says, forsake not to abide. It's corporate worship. You make connection by praise and worship. Amen? Amen. And it says in verse 10, And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. There's going to be a lot of people who do not, who think they're ready and they will be left behind. Afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, surely I say to you, I do not know you. See, there's a lot of people just because they may read something about someone. They really don't know him. Does everybody get it? In other words, you may be talking to somebody on the phone and even write letters back and forth to them. But there's a difference when you meet that person in that person's presence. And that's how God is with me and you. Those who really know his presence will enter. There's a difference between knowing his presence because it allows you to know who he truly is. Amen? Amen? than to just read about them. It's the same thing you can go out and buy with Sports Illustrated, and you've heard this before. You can read all about an individual, a sports player, know all their statistics and everything, and never meet them, and think you know them. But you really don't know them, just because you read about them. And the Lord is saying this to those who proclaim to be Christians. He's saying, you say you know me, but you really don't know me. He even says you search the scriptures thinking you have salvation, but you won't come to me and get it. There's a difference. And he said to them, surely I say to you, I do not know you. Verse 13. 
Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. In other words, you never know when your time is up. So it's important in this that we constantly maintain a connection to God's presence. We've been talking about this a lot. One of the things that God wants to give me and you, and we're going to talk a little bit about this, is called fresh vision. Fresh vision. To maintain a fresh vision, you must maintain sight. Is everybody with me? And this can only come from the presence of God. So that means you must maintain a fresh presence of God to maintain sight and vision. You cannot maintain vision without maintaining a pr fresh presence of God. And Acts chapter 2. Fresh vision. We're going to clarify actually what vision is. Acts chapter 2. I'm going to start at verse 1. Hallelujah. Is everybody there? Then the day of Pentecost, let's speak, it had come fully. They were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. It says that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. This is how the church began. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Does everybody get it? And they began to speak with other tongues. Hello. This is how the church began. As the Spirit gave them utterance. Why? Because one of the essential things that Jesus commanded, he commanded them to go wait in Jerusalem for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Why? So they can get a language that can speak directly to the Father where the devil cannot interpret. And verse 5. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, because they were there to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone had heard them speak in their own language. Now, there are multiple gifts of the Holy Spirit. One of the gifts is not only tongues, which is the foundation but there's diversities of tongues. And there's diversities of tongues because it's an allowing you to go somewhere and you speak in tongue and your language will change. <clears throat> then there's the interpretation of tongues. So you may be sitting on a plane with someone who may be from Russia next to you and the Holy Spirit may say to you, speak in tongues. And you'll start speaking in tongues, and next thing you know, your language changes. And God will be speaking to that person right next to you in another language. And this is what happened there. They were actually hearing their languages. They started praying in tongues, and then their diverse language, another language came. One time, my wife and I came home from a revival, and... Um, we had a video of some of the stuff that was going on there. And when we put the video in, I was watching this video, and mom and another person and my wife was in, in, the, in the living room. And when I saw the glory, I said, Lord, that's your glory. The next thing I know, all breath was taken out of me. And I was filled. And I, I was flipping and flopping like a fish out of water. I had no control over myself. You thought I had an epileptic seizure. 
but it was the glory of God. Because one of the things I said to the Lord while I was watching this video, I said, Lord, that's your glory. Well, that glory hit me. <clears throat> the next thing I know, my wife moved the coffee table out of the way. I flew on the ground, on the living room floor, and I'm rolling back and forth. And my language was praying all kinds of language. I was praying Japanese, Chinese, Portuguese. I mean, I was interceding for nations in multiple, multiple na in languages as I was rolling on this floor. And when I eventually stopped, I saw the face of the Lord come in the living room and he said, be not dismayed, I've come to dwell with you. Then he said, I want you to lay hands on everyone in part the desire for the lost because I had a tremendous and I still have a tremendous desire for the lost. And so I was, as I was on the ground, everybody came down and I laid hands on them. But it gave me the revelation and I, and I have a good friend of mine who's a missionary and he tri travels all over the place all over every country. And when they go into these countries, they just start praying in tongues. He'll be out preaching and he starts praying in tongues and his language changes and people get a message in their language. That's called diversities of tongues. It's in the word of God under the gifts of the spirit. Amen? Is everybody okay? So this is what happened when the day of Pentecost came. And a lot of them were confused because they heard their languages. They're going, man, what's going on? And, 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 and in verse 7 it says, And they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? Galileans, whatever. In other words, they were from Galatia. <laughs> and so they were all from one place, but they had their own language. But they weren't speaking in their language. They were speaking in everybody else's national languages. And how is it that, verse 8, how is it that we hear each of our own language in which we were born? Per Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, uh, uh, whatever it is, Kappakokikia, Kakaya, Pontus, Asia, and all the rest of the places. Verse 11. Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own languages the wonderful works of God. That's what they were hearing, weren't they? The wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this be? Others mocking, and they said, they're full of wine. They're drunk. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to the men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. Blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. Before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Wow. Again, he's saying something very powerful. He's saying, I'm going to be pouring out my anointing, which is carried by my Holy Spirit. And you will be releasing prophetic words. You'll be prophesying. You will have visions. You will have dreams. In other words, there'll be more. That's because this is going to be the gifts of the Holy Spirit that will come in when you are baptized in the Holy Spirit. There'll be diversities of tongues and tongues and interpretations and in tongues. In other words, he's saying fresh vision comes from the fresh presence of God. So in other words, the reason so many times that people lose vision or sight is because they're not maintaining the connection, that fresh presence. Now you can come into a worship service and not connect because you're still thinking about you. 
you're still thinking about all the things that you got to do, what you need to do or whatever. Or there's still guilt or condemnation or whatever it may be that's still dealing with you. Instead of making connect and making that connection, you're still in the way. That's why the word says we must deny ourselves, pick up the cross and follow. Amen. In Luke chapter 4. Fresh vision. In verse 16. So as Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Why? Because he'd been anointed. Have you been anointed? Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. In other words, the gospel is a representation of Truth, truth of eternity, truth of a savior, truth of a deliverer, truth of healing. And he sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom or liberty to the captives, and to recover of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who've been oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. In other words, Jesus took what was prophesied by Isaiah, and that's what he's speaking about. Amen? He's taking what was prophesied by Joel, and he's putting this together because it was already written before he came, and he came to fulfill what was written. And so he spoke this into existence on this day, and it came by the price of his death, resurrection, and ascension where he sits at the right hand of the Father. Now, 50 days after his resurrection, he poured out his spirit. That's what's called Pentecost. And that's where he commanded him to go to the upper room in Acts 1. And so, 50 days after resurrection, he released the Holy Spirit to those washed by the blood of the Lamb and accepted the baptism of the Holy Spirit to become offsprings of the anointing and carriers of the ministry of Jesus in the spirit, not in the letter. We are now carrying the ministry of Christ in the spirit, not in the letter. Now think about this many times. It's an honor and a blessing that we have the word of God. And they found the scrolls and they're able to confirm the things that were written. But the apostles had no Bible. They had the presence of God. They had the anointing which connected them to God's presence, power, and truth. They heard God's voice. God does visit them in dreams and visions. Look at what he, he did to John and how he wrote the book of Revelation. He had to put him aside and get him arrested so he could go into an island. And there he spoke to him the book of Revelations. God's still doing those same things today, you know. He still comes to heal to, and to bring freedom. He daily loads us with benefits. But one of the things he wants to do and he wants to release to us today is the arena and the reality of the importance of a fresh vision all the time. That means maintaining your vision. It's like keeping your, ga your car filled with gas you can't continue to go on unless it's filled. You and I can't go on unless we're filled. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians, oh, chapter 2. Yeah. In verse 9. Fresh vision. 
Is everybody there? That's good. Let's speak it together. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Those who love him. He says, if you love me, you'll obey me. But God has revealed them to us through what? Through his spirit. What is he revealing? The things that God has prepared for us. Amen? For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows <clears throat> the things of man except the Spirit of man, which is in him. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we, we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which in the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. He's saying, eyes to see, ears to hear. What God has for us is called vision. That's what's called vision. What is it? It is revealed by the presence of the Holy Spirit. We must maintain a fresh vision which comes from God's fresh presence so that you and I can see. To be baptized in the Holy Spirit is to be baptized in death. That means death to yourself. You no longer live for you. Amen. We are not only baptized in the death of Christ, but we are baptized in the life of Christ. We are baptized in power. We are now baptized in the fellowship with the Trinity. This is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We are baptized in the divine nature of Christ to fulfill the mission of existence. We reach a level or a place where we're no longer relying on humanism. We become to a place where we become humanless. Where we know that human assistance is not going to work according to the kingdom. God uses man, but that's not our relying on. Amen? We no longer lean on those things. We trust completely on the Lord. So that we're no longer relying on human, what we call traditions, human precepts. We've reached a place of humanless. I'm humanless. I'm no longer a part of this human humanity. I'm a part of eternity. I'm no longer relying on this place. I'm no longer relying on what I see. I'm no longer relying on what I think. I'm no longer relying on what I feel. I'm no longer relying on what people say. I'm no longer relying on the circumstances of my life. I've come out of them. I've stepped out. And by stepping out, I'm stepping in the fresh presence of God. Does everybody get this? In Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, in verse 17. Oh, hallelujah. Let's speak it together. Galatians 2, 17. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. <laughs> For if I build again those things which I what? I destroyed. I make myself a what? Transgressors. This is where so many times God has freed us from things and then people go back to them. Amen. So he says, well, I make myself a transgressor. For through the law... For I through the law died to the law that I might live to Christ... I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the natural realm, what we call the flesh, I live by faith. I live by what? Faith, which is your connection in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. 
In other words, what he's saying, I'm crucified with Christ in the new life in the physical realm. I live by my connection of faith to his presence, his power, and his truth in Christ Jesus through the Holy Spirit. Everything is through the Holy Spirit. In other words, so if I live my life now because of my connection to his presence, his power, and his truth in Jesus through the Holy Spirit, and that also connects me to the Father. Now I'm in relationship with the Trinity. And I'm always awaiting, or what we call seeking, which we might even say, <laughs> a fresh presence of God. So we're always awaiting and we are seeking. We are desiring a fresh presence of God because we know without that fresh presence of God, we cannot maintain. But the enemy likes to bring compromise or complacency. Amen? And when the fresh presence of God comes, it refreshes our sight and our hearing. When you refresh your sight and your hearing, it's going to refresh your vision. Is everybody with me? It refreshes your vision. Sight is constant then. Now what is vision? Vision is your purpose of commission. What is vision? Your purpose of your commission. So God will give you vision of the commission, what he wants you to do. And so many people lose sight of that because they don't make connection to the fresh presence of God or they lose physical sight. Sight is the constant, which is constant and vision, which is the purpose of commission. And this is when, the, when vision comes, when fresh vision comes, it comes because there is a, what we might say, a reflection of revelation. So revelation comes, here, there comes this reflection of revelation, and in it you get your vision, or fresh vision. <clears throat> now vision comes in multiple ways. In Acts 26. Is everybody okay? Acts 26. Fresh vision. Now, you know, the enemy wants to interrupt everything. He wants to prevent you from maintaining a fresh vision. It's like watering it and maintaining it. In Acts 26 and verse 19. Is everybody there? Let's speak it together. Acts 26, verse 19. Therefore, King Agrippi, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Now, this is Paul telling them because he was arrested. And he's saying, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Which, why? Because he maintained a fresh vision. So what is a vision? It's, it's the area of the purpose of his commission. He was doing what he had seen. Does everybody get this? But he de but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should what? Repent, turn to God, and do the works befitting repentance. So what was he trying to tell him? He said, look it, because he'd been arrested. He was before the king to be judged. He said, look it, I got to tell you, I'm not disobedient to the heavenly vision. I'm going to do this no matter what. Why? Because this vision is the purpose of my commission. So God is going to give you a vision, which is the purpose of your commission. He will speak to you through a vision. You will see things. You will know things. But it's not going to come unless you're willing to get connected to God's presence. Verse, 20, uh, verse 21. For these reasons, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. Therefore, having obtained help from God, to this day I stand witnessing both to small and great, saying no other things man to man to those which the prophets and Moses said would come, that Christ would suffer, and that he would be the first to rise from the dead and will proclaim the light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. So what he was explaining, he was giving them his case. But what was Paul doing? He was 
obtaining, he was staying on that commission of the vision, no matter what. And he kept it alive. If you notice, Paul kept saying, I've had many revelations. I'm, all kinds of things was happening to Paul. So we must keep alive the vision. Some of us have not had that vision yet. But as you keep pressing through, when it's time, God will give you the vision for your purpose. Amen? And sometimes you're already doing it and you don't even realize it. But everything that you and I are doing is being trained to fulfill the vision. What is the vision? It is the purpose of the commission. Oh, hallelujah. Proverbs 29. So call it a, Paul called it a heavenly vision, the purpose of his commission from God. This is where we are to take the fresh presence of God. Get in there. Proverbs 29. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Fresh vision. Not flesh vision, fresh vision. There's too many flesh visions and not all the fresh visions. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, um, in this fresh presence of God, there's an area where we're taken. We're taken, but we're left. Does everybody hear me? You are taken in the spirit but you're left in the physical. Amen. Though I still live in the physical, my life is in the spirit. There's a difference. And if your life is in the spirit, then you know the essentialness of being connected to God's presence. And being connected to God's presence will maintain that sight or that fresh vision. We must be refreshed all the time. And that's what happened to the ten virgins that were foolish. They didn't get refreshed. They began to drift. They lost sight and they lost vision. And one of the things, when you begin to lose sight and you begin to lose vision, you lose identity. Proverbs 29, 18. Whoever walks blamelessly will be what? Oops, sorry. That's 28. 18. Let's speak it together. Where there is no what? Where there is no what? Where there is no what? Revelation. The people cast off restraints. But happy is he who keeps the law. In other words, where there is no revelation. No revelation of word. No, revel no revelation of information. Remember we talked about vision being a reflection of revelation. So where there is no revelation, there is no refreshing to the vision. Which is your purpose of commission or command. Lack of this revelation is the beginning of removal of freshness. It is also the area to where the old man, it's because you're now removing the restraints that used to be on. Because revelation maintains the restraints and the, main, the restraints maintain control over the flesh. So as he's Restraints are being removed. The old man begins to take over. And the drift is in process. And it if the drift continues, it goes distant further, further, and further, and further away. And the next thing you know, you're losing purpose. You're losing identity and everything else. You know, again, the closer you are to water, if it's pouring down, you can feel it. Bouncing off of things, can't you? If you're near a stream or you're near a, a falls or whatever, the closer you get to that falls, you can feel the mist. Until you finally step into that water and you get saturated. That's like God's presence. The closer you are, you begin to sense that mist. And then there's that saturation time of refreshing. But the further you stay away, the further distance you are from that, the more carnal you become. You lose vision. You're no longer, that's where Jesus, that's, that's where we were talked about, you know, being hot instead of cold. 
and being lukewarm instead of hot. In Psalm 16, fresh vision. Now, these visions are always associated with expanding the kingdom of God. Amen? God is trying to show us what to do or tell us what to do through the vision to expand the kingdom. Psalm 16 and verse 7. Let's speak it. I will bless the Lord who has given me what? Counsel. Can you get counsel through revelation? Yes, you can. My heart also instructs me in a night season. Can God speak to you while you sleep? Yes. Can you get revelation through that? When we said I speak to you through dreams, amen, prophecies, visions. I have set the Lord always before me because he's at my right hand. I shall not be what? Now, this is powerful. So if you're setting the Lord before you, then his presence is radiating from him to you, isn't it? Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in hell, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life. And how will he show you the path of life? Through vision. Does everybody get it? Fresh vision. Then he says... In your presence is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are what? Pleasures evermore. Again, the path of life is fresh vision, purpose of commission from the fresh presence of the Lord, in which is constant joy and access to the heavenly pleasures. In Acts 3. In verse 18. As you continue your walk in the Lord and you're constantly being saturated in His presence and connecting with refreshing. And of course, in this you'll find out the, your, the, main, the formula of maintaining denial of yourself, fighting and following. God will expand your vision. He adds to it. And as He begins to add to it, it's so that He can, I want to say, supply for it. He begins to make connections to, for this purpose of his mission through you in the vision. He speaks to each and every one in certain ways. But majority of the time we miss it. Because we're so caught up in other things that we don't see it. In Acts 3.18. Is everybody there? Let's speak it together. Hallelujah. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of his prophets that Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent therefore and be what? Converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of what? Refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before whom heaven must rejoice, who, receive, who heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all of his holy prophets since the world began. Again, he says, here it is. We must repent. Repent is associating with turning away. Turning away. Not only do you repent with your mouth, you ask for forgiveness, but you turn away from the things that you keep doing that brings offense to God. Turn away from the worldly lust turn, and then get refreshed in his presence, which brings a refreshing to your vision, which is the purpose of commission. Isaiah chapter 5.
fresh vision. You always want to confirm visions. Don't just run off on it. Amen? That's what the word says, a multitude of counsel. There is safety and wisdom. Too many people run off on their visions when they're actually flesh visions and they're not fresh visions from God. And then they wonder why they have all kinds of problems. In verse 20, Whoa! This doesn't mean hold on horsey. Whoa! means without eternity. W-O-E. Whoa! To those who call evil good and good evil. Who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Whoa! To those who are wise in their own eyes. And prudent in their own sight. Woe to men, mighty at drinking wine. Woe to men, violent, violent, for mixing and intoxicating drinks, who justified the wicked for a bribe and take away justice from the righteous. Woe. Woe to them. You know, in this is without eternity. Their visions are about self more than anything. They're more set on themselves. They're always putting themselves first because they truly have no true vision. There is no true vision. Romans 8. Hallelujah. Romans 8, verse 27. Let's speak it. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for the good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to what? His purpose. So will they have vision? Yes. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, when he predestined these, he also called. Whom he called, these also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Oh, yes. The purpose of your commission is through vision. I'm going to close it. 1 Corinthians 1. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.18. You know, you have not because you ask not. People are asking for everything else but what God needs them to have. Verse 18, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, or you see your what? Vision. Your vision. 
How can you do a calling without your vision? You don't. For you see your vision, you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Amen. And we have a lot to glory. We have a lot to rejoice about. Fresh vision. If you haven't gotten it, get it. Amen. That's a reflection of revelation. By maintaining your vision, you'll maintain course. And God will provide. Amen. Thank you, Father, for your word. We are honored and blessed. We apply the blood of Jesus on your word this morning that's been imparted in us. And we ask, Lord, that you will continue to pour out your spirit that we may have sight, that we may have hearing and that we may be refreshed in the vision that you've given us so we can fulfill our purpose and destiny and calling in you, in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen.